you've probably heard, if you haven't, you haven't been paying attention, NASA's going back to the moon. Has everybody heard that? So how cool is that? This time with commercial and international partners that'll help explore faster and explore more. And after a successful efforts to commercialize low Earth orbit, which is now the purview of a lot of commercial enterprises and um, a lot of junk and debris as well as a lot of good stuff, um, there's renewed commitment to this effort, which calls for the partnership to launch and operate a new space station that will be called the Gateway. The Gateway will first explore the moon from above and put men and women on the surface by 2024. To celebrate this endeavor and to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first moonwalk, who was there watching that happen back in 19... Oh, a lot of you, so a lot of youngsters like me here. Yes, fantastic. Um, the SETI Institute, we've organized two summer talks about this ambitious program, which is officially known as Artemis. And you're going to hear more about it tonight. And to guide us through this conversation and lead tonight's effort is our good friend and colleague from NASA, David Morrison. I'm going to introduce David, and then David will come up and tell you a little bit more about tonight's talks and introduce the other speakers. So David is the senior scientist of the New Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, otherwise known as SERVI, located at the NASA Ames Research Center right up the street here in Mountain View, about five minutes from our office. The Lunar Science Institute will link competitively selected science teams across the nation working together to help lead the research activities related to lunar exploration goals. Survey research includes studies of the moon, including lunar samples from the moon and or on the moon. David also continues as the senior scientist at the NASA Astrobiology Institute, where he participates in a variety of research programs in astrobiology, which is the study of life and universe. From 1996 to 2001, David was the director of astrobiology and space research at Ames, managing research programs in the space, life, and earth sciences. David was also previously the director of the Carl Sagan Center for Research at the SENI Institute. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the California Academy of Sciences. He chaired the 1991 NASA study of impact hazards that recommended that a space guard survey be carried out to search for potentially threatening asteroids and comets. And in 1995, he received the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal for this work. And I will tell you that in 1996, he received another one. And I'm going to stop here because if I continue to read David's bio and to talk about all the accolades, awards, recognitions, and positions he's held, we're going to be here all night. So I'm going to stop there, but invite you to go to the website uh, for the SETI Institute, SETI Talks, and you can read David's full uh, biography there. But the last and coolest thing I'll mention about David before turning it over to him is he has asteroid 2410 Morrison named in his honor. How cool is that? <laughs> it makes me realize how lucky we are to be on this planet, which is not only a uniquely life-friendly planet, but we can look up in the sky and see this other planet that's associated with us. You can tell it's a real object, the moon. It's a place that beckons to us, intellectually and uh, in some cases physically, that we would like to go there. Um, before we get into this discussion, let me just point out that there is a certain ambiguity about the statement that we are going back to the moon. As far as I'm concerned, we've always been there. Uh, there are dozens of spacecraft that have flown to the moon, many of them in the last decade, uh, landers, orbiters, rovers, coming not just from the US, but from China, from India, uh, from other countries who share our fascination with our neighbor and our hopes that we can better utilize it and better understand it. It was not going to be done just by sending humans. Uh, in fact, it's a little ambiguous to even think of, of the role of humans because no spacecraft goes out there without humans. Humans design them. Humans build them. Humans test them. Humans operate them. They are a robotic extension of ourselves. So our exploration of the moon and elsewhere, I hope will include humans on the surface, but even if we aren't standing on the surface, we will be a part of it. This is an extension of ourselves to explore our neighbor which is potentially of such great interest scientifically and, uh, and perhaps in other ways too will be revealed. 
So tonight we have two great speakers. Greg Schmidt is first, uh, and uh, he is the director of the NASA survey, the institute, what I call the uh, Exploration Science Institute. He was the deputy director of the NASA Lunar Science Institute. He's been involved in, in NASA missions, uh, probably longer than he would like to, to remember. You know, Greg and I and Michael and so many of us were here for Apollo. We watched the Apollo landings. We followed the Apollo closely. It seems amazing, that's 50 years ago, but that was a great inspiration to us. And it's still great that Greg is now in a position of management and leadership to, to help structure uh, our new trips to the moon. Uh, Michael Sims is our other speaker. I'll say a few words about him in a minute, but I think the appropriate thing now is to introduce Greg Schmidt. Well, thanks so much, David, and what an honor um, and privilege it is to uh, speak to uh, all of you this evening. Um, and I can't imagine a better way of starting an evening like this by the applause that I just hear heard by uh, we're going back to the moon. And, and uh, I am just as excited as all of you. I was one of the people that raised my hands uh, when Bill asked, uh, did you see this? Um, I remember it well. I was uh, just shy of 10 years old. Um, and uh, David and I uh, were invited for the 40th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing by Buzz Aldrin to uh, come up to the USS Hornet. And, uh, and I uh, had the great privilege of bringing my then 10-year-old, now 20-year-old daughter with me. And, uh, and I got a picture of her with uh, Buzz, and I told Buzz, you know, Buzz, when I saw um, you and Neil walking on the, on the surface, that's how old I was. And maybe, maybe that didn't make me that popular with, uh, <laughs> with Buzz. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, I'd, I'd, I'd like to start here um, with, by, with my talk about looking forward with a quick look um, back. And, well, I'm not exactly sure why that's not playing. All right. There, there we go. Okay. Step off the lamp now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It's very, very famous words, some of the most uh, famous words ever spoken. My own grandmother, um, who was born in 1892 and passed away in, in 1973, did a needlepoint for me that's one, that's one of my prized possessions. And this needlepoint has a picture of Neil stepping off um, the lamb onto the lunar surface with those words. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's something that I look at uh, quite often. And I think about what she saw in her lifetime when she was riding horses and buggies when she was young. There were no airplanes, there were no cars. And at the end, people were walking on the moon. Um, I happen to be one of those that thinks that space is transformational. It's transformational for, um, for humankind. And I think that we've only just seen the beginning of what it's going to do. Um, we, have, uh, we have commercial companies that are being developed, such as Michael's that he's going to be talking with you about in a few minutes, um, that are engaged. Elon Musk, of course, that we all hear about. But but many, many others. And uh, this is what's going to get us up there to stay. We're the, we, NASA, are the, uh, some of the pioneers, um, but what, what we need to do is get up there to stay. So anyway, Apollo um, was a uh, remarkably successful uh, program. We had six lunar landings. We had 12 um, people, 12 men. Who, uh, um, who walked on the uh, surface of the moon. We want to change that. Um, we, the, uh, you might have heard that the uh, NASA administrators say that the uh, next plan mission to the moon's surface um, it will include the, the first woman to work, walk on the moon. I wouldn't be uh, unpleased at all if it were two of the two crew, just saying that. 
So um, we, uh, we explored, we had a wonderful um, set of explorations, but what you can see in this picture here is we did not cover very much territory. Um, Apollo 11, we took a few steps around the LAM and came back. It was, uh, it was about safety. In later missions, we introduced rovers um, to uh, traverse increasing amounts of areas. What we did do, though, is we got a, a trove of samples that have absolutely revolutionized our, uh, our knowledge about the moon and about lunar science. This is some of the work that my institute is doing right now. And even now, 50 years later, those samples are teaching us um, remarkable new things. Um, it was the samples back uh, closer to 40 um, to 45 years ago that, uh, that gave us the idea that the moon was actually created um, by a giant impact of a Mars-sized planet with the, uh, with the early Earth. And there have been so many other lessons that have been taught to us by samples. So um, we, as David pointed out correctly, um, we really never left the moon. There were a couple of decades when we didn't do um, very much. But, uh, but we've actually had an increasing interest in the moon for uh, quite a number of years now. And so, for instance, um, there's, a, uh, there's a United States spacecraft that has, uh, is about to celebrate its um, 10th anniversary. It just celebrated the 10th anniversary of its launch. That's the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, along with that um, was launched the uh, LCROSS mission, which was managed at NASA's Ames Research Center about five miles from here. One of the people in the audience, Dr. Kim Enico-Smith, was one of the scientists associated with that. Could you raise your hand, please? <laughs> so, uh, so kudos to Kim for the fabulous work um, that, uh, that she and, and others did. Um, this was the mission that showed there is water on the moon. So, um, and, and uh, yeah, WOW is absolutely right. This is, uh, this is amazing. It's not the, uh, the bone dry um, thing that we used to uh, think it is, but there's a whole suite of other missions. And it, as David correctly pointed out, and this is one of the things that I, I like so much about serving at NASA now um, versus say 50 years ago, it's not the United States and the Soviet Union. It's the United States and, uh, and 18 different space agencies that are involved in this in some, uh, in some way. Um, some launching their, other, their own missions, some participating in, uh, um, in missions in other ways. Um, we have Mexico, which is planning to launch a, a, a payload on on one of the uh, commercial um, missions. We have Korea that's planning to launch an orbiter in the near term. And uh, we have China that did the uh, very first exploration of the far side of the moon. And uh, wow, that's a, that is an amazing achievement. You know, so one of the things that I like to say, it's not your grandfather's or grandmother's moon anymore. I mean, this is a really different, really exciting, place. And I will admit, um, when my good friend David Morrison here asked me to join him to start this new institute, the NASA Lunar Science Institute, about uh, 12 or 11 or 12 years ago, um, it, was, um, it was the idea of starting a new institute, a new virtual institute that really captivated me. I'm not a lunar scientist by, uh, by training. My background is more in, in uh, human exploration, which is the major, one of the major things that our institute does. But the more I learn, learn about the moon, the more fascinating it becomes. And so, um, and so we have new data um, from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that shows us this is, you can see here, um, altimeter data um, from a laser altimeter that's one of the instruments aboard this uh, mission that I talked about that shows um, that shows that the near side and, and far side are two very different places. And one of the things that I want to point out about this is there's something called the South Pole Aiken Basin, some of you may have heard of, um, that came from a giant impact to the moon very early in its history. 
And there is, we believe, exposed um, lunar mantle at, uh, um, it within that area, and that's an area of intense interest for us to learn a whole lot more um, about the moon, and, and in particular, the lunar interior. Um, we, have, um, we have missions um, that have looked at the, uh, at the moon's crust, um, analyzing the uh, crustal thickness. One of the interesting missions that was done a few years ago, led by uh, Maria Zuber of, uh, of MIT, was the GRAIL mission which did a gravity map of the, uh, of the moon, um, looking, uh, looking at some of the things that we call mass cons, mass concentrations on the moon that actually influence um, how, we, uh, how we fly around the moon, how we fly spacecraft around the moon. Um, we have um, analyses that have been done. This is one of the older ones but, uh, that you're seeing here, but, uh, but there are newer ones as well. Um, taking a look at, uh, um, using spectral analyses, taking a look at mineralogy. And there are those, particularly um, in this new uh, commercial world that I mentioned, that are interested in things like platinum group metals. Um, are these metals um, likely from asteroid impacts, are they available um, to be harvested? And if they are, um, the economic case for the moon is, uh, is a really simple one, and we're going to be seeing a whole lot of flights there. Um, so uh, we have uh, other things as well um, to, uh, that, that, that I find really interesting. This actually has to do with the LCROSS uh, mission excuse me, that uh, um, Dr. Uh, Kim Anico-Smith um, was, was on. And um, one of the things about the interesting things about the moon because of its uh, because of its geometry and its in its uh, axis um, tilt is there are permanently shadowed regions on the moon and uh, these are some of the coldest spots in the solar system actually such that they become traps for water and so the Elcross mission that I discussed um, actually impacted into into one of these the Cabeus crater and, uh, and that's how we found it, the, uh, the water. There's uh, a tremendous amount of water on the moon, and uh, water can supply um, materials for life support, it can supply oxygen, it can supply fuel. And so, um, and so we're, in, we're keenly interested at NASA in um, ascertaining how much of it there is and, uh, um, and, and how to get at it. And so we've developed maps. Um, this is, this is um, one of the ones developed by uh, folks working at my institute um, for the, uh, using some data from uh, one of the uh, missions to uh, ascertain just where um, that water is. This is one of the uh, maps that was published, I believe, about a year ago. Now, um, I think that uh, um, one of the things that we did at my institute as well, um, a little over a year ago, at the request of the head of science at NASA, is to take a look at what are the biggest questions? What are the big questions in lunar science in the future? And uh, I won't go over all of these, but, uh, but it's amazing what the moon can do in terms of um, answering questions that you wouldn't necessarily expect you'd be able to answer. So the moon, of course, has, um, has essentially no atmosphere. Um, and as such, um, it, uh, when you have a crater on the moon, it lasts for a very, very long time. And so it preserves a record of the early solar system. And that can be used to uh, ascertain what were the planets like um, in, the, uh, in the early solar system. And there's something called the Nice model that was uh, developed at a uh, workshop in, in Nice, France. And, uh, and it turns out that, uh, that the planets were not, most likely were not in their current configuration um, that we all studied you know, when we were eight or 10 years old. Um, they were not that way um, a number of billion years ago in the early solar system, say four billion years ago. And, uh, and so we've been able to learn a lot about that through studies of the moon. 
Another thing um, for me that I find particularly interesting is uh, astrophysics. The far side of the moon is, uh, is a radio quiet zone. And all these, all these little things that, uh, that each and every one of us has in our uh, pockets, they're really noisy. And uh, particularly in some very interesting frequency areas. And so, uh, so it turns out that the quietest area in the inner solar system is actually the far side of the moon. Since the moon is tidally locked, we always see one side. And so if you're on the far side, it's very, very radio quiet. What that, me what that means is that you can see deep into the universe's history and answer some very important uh, questions on astrophysics. So um, let's see. So I want to... Oh. It's not the, uh, here we go. I want to talk um, actually next briefly about, uh, about our return to the moon, or like we say, we're going forward to the moon. And so this is Space Policy Directive 1, which was signed by the president um, a year and a half ago, I believe. <coughs> And, um, and I think that it's a, um, it's, it's a really good direction for us to take. Um, we are going back, we're going forward to the moon in a very different way than we did. This is not about, as we at NASA say, flags and footprints. This is about going back in a sustainable way. And what do you need for that? You need to, number one, you need to engage the whole world that is interested in doing this. That's what we're doing. Um, we at my institute are doing that. We've been doing that since the institute started. Um, but then also, we need to take advantage of the uh, new commercial industry in this area that Michael will be talking with you about. And so, um, and so it's all about going there to stay. And so um, I only have one slide about our plan for, uh, for going to the moon because it's in, a, uh, it's in a huge state of flux right now, as you might imagine. We at NASA are, uh, are looking to get the necessary budget um, for uh, moving forward with this. Um, our administrator, I've met him a couple of times, and, um, and he is very keen to not take money from other areas within NASA. Um, earth science, space science, things that are, um, that are giving, um, giving very important data to the scientific community and to the world. He doesn't want to take that in order to uh, return humans to the, uh, to the moon, and I admire him greatly for that. And so we have initiated the Artemis program, and, uh, and as you can see, we actually are planning um, I, our first missions with Artemis, um, at, starting in just a little over two years, in 20, 2022, with a uh, landing of, again, the first woman and next man on the moon in, uh, in 2024. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, there will be a, a gateway. Um, I think this is, uh, this is a wise way of, uh, of doing a lunar return because it's not just about going to the moon again um, once or twice or five times. It's about setting, an, setting up an infrastructure so that we can go again and again and again repeatedly and that we can harvest resources from the moon that will enable us to take that next big step to, uh, to Mars afterwards. So, um, so it's all about Number one, science and exploration. That's what my institute is about, and that's, um, that's so much at, at NASA's core. But then living off the, off the land through um, what we call in situ resource utilization, using that water um, that, we've, uh, that we've discovered to support life and to support future missions, um, having, having creating fuel, doing mining, such as I uh, mentioned uh, earlier, and manufacturing and really becoming a multi-planet species. So, um, so that's what I have. Um, I actually, um, if there's time, I have a, uh, a video um, to show that's, uh, that's
that, that is a compilation of some very nice images from uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and it's set to music. It came out um, just a couple of months ago, so...
All right, then I'm going to introduce Michael Sims, who's, uh, who had a distinguished career at NASA Ames, uh, working in robotics and artificial intelligence, and thereby put himself uh, into the uh, region where he is desired by uh, the, uh, the commercial world and is leading in what is going to be a very important part of our continuing exploration of the moon, uh, the kind of partnership between humans and machines that we're capable of doing. So Michael, if you'll come up, uh, we'd like to hear that, and I expect part of our continuing discussion will be the relative roles or the opportunities uh, for human and machine exploration in tandem. Um, I am delighted to be here. Uh, I, I think, and thanks to Bill and the SETI Institute, um, SETI is one of those things that humanity does, which is precious. It's one of our primary reaching out and understanding the universe and where our life and other life fit into that. So um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm honored to be here with these uh, prestigious colleagues. I have a company called Ceres Robotics, and we're in the business of building robots to work on the moon and the Mars and asteroids. Uh, and we're focused on surface robots. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're involved in, but basically the context of what I'm going to say in the next few minutes is really uh, what can you do with the tools that we have in, in exploration uh, to do the kind of investigations that are important to SETI. So um, uh, we, NASA recently uh, approved, uh, NASA is trying to do, as Greg said, commercial endeavors into space and recently approved uh, three landers to, to land over the next two years on the moon. And my company, Sirius Robotics, uh, is partnered with the company that built the, the lander on the right called Orbit Beyond. And uh, we're one of the three landers, and we're going to be the first lander. We're going to land there next year in September. Um, we will be the first commercial lander on the moon. We'll be the first commercial robot on the moon and the first U.S. robot on the moon in more than 45. We're starting out cheap, and we're starting out small. Um, but that's really the game we're trying to play. Commercially, what we want to do is we want to take what are very expensive endeavors in space and try to figure out how to make those affordable so we can actually do the kinds of things we want to do. So the way to think of this is think of the price of doing one of these missions, maybe one-tenth or maybe one-hundredth what you're traditionally used to doing. And that has the impact that it will allow us to do the kind of things we want to do in space. I'm personally committed to humans being multi-planetary um, and all the things we can accomplish in that. And one of those things we can accomplish are scientific investigations in a way that we've never been able to do before. So um, I, I, it starts with a dream. Um, there's a set of dreams here. Uh, I think Greg mentioned having a child of eight or 10. Well, when I was about that age, I had a golden book of astronomy. And there was one page on each of the planets and a few other pages, one on the moon. That was pivotal in me actually going into science and understanding. And I can just remember staying in bed and looking at that. Oh, that's what, that's what Neptune looks like and things like that. So um, our dreams have driven us. Um, these are, you see in, on the top, some science fiction, science fiction, which both in movies and in writing has always been pivotal to me. And what you see at the bottom are dreams that actually have recently been created out of the commercial world, which is the idea that we can have very large landers which do things on the moon and Mars, uh, which make it capable for humans to go there in large and carry large mass. And one of the things about large mass going to those surfaces is that we can tell, carry scientific instruments. And instead of a tiny little robot like I showed you, we can actually carry a caterpillar or a large construction vehicle, or a boring device to create mines underworld, underground. So that is a dream, and the insta instantiation of those dreams uh, showed up oh, 50 years ago, effectively, uh, when we went to the moon initially. And there are a couple of things that came out of that. Um, one is, what you see here are two of the first 
robots or rovers that came out of that. The bottom one is the Apollo um, buggy or whatever you want to call it. And basically the astronauts sat in there and drove around pretending it was um, a cool hot rod and they created a lot of dust in the air and going over hills and flying through the air, which is pretty easy at, at sixth gravity. Um, and in the upper right, you see a, the first, what we would call rover that went to the moon, which is a Lunacod. Um, this is the one in a lab, but they actually, two of those went to the moon. And it's only been in the last year or so that we've broken the record of how far those two rovers drove on the moon. Um, and that was by opportunity. So um, as part of this process, we, we, NASA, have sent a number of rovers into, robots into space. Here are three that, out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, have gone to the moon. Um, the smallest is Sojourner. The medium one is the MER class, so Curiosity and Spirit. And the large one is Curiosity, which is on the, room, on the Mars operating right now. And the thing about the rovers, I want to say two things about the utility of that for scientific investigations. And in particular in this case, for investigations that have a relevance to the search for life in, in the universe. Um, what you see in the upper left is a picture of a place called Eagle Crater. And we landed the Opportunity Crater, Opportunity Rover in Eagle Crater uh, in, 19, in 2004. And we landed on that white thing in the middle uh, full of airbags, right? And about four meters in front of us, there was this wonderful outcrop, which you can see at the bottom part of this image. Um, and that outcrop contained part of the essence of what we really wanted to know. Was there liquid water here? Was there water flowing here? And if we look at the at stratification that looks at there, it turns out there was. If we look at the mineralogy, it turns out this makes sense for there have been liquid water in this place. Lots of hematites and stuff like that. Um, but we actually would have not have known that if we weren't able to get off that lander and get over up close and see those things and take microscopic images of them. So the, the mobility, the robotic unit with mobility added a lot to being able to perceive that this ingredient that's essential for life in the universe uh, was there or not. And so that was one instance of it. A second one I want to point out is that uh, Curiosity rover, um, there have been many, let me back up a little bit, there have been many um, claims, uh, observations that seem consistent with there being methane on Mars. And we never quite know because uh, first you observe it, it's there, and then you look again, and it's not there. That kind of makes some sense because it might get blown around the wind. Um, and also the half-life of methane on the surface of a planet like Mars is not very long, a year, whatever. Um, so it, it will go away over time. Um, so we've never quite been sure, but the thing about methane is methane can be produced by abiotic processes, but it also can be produced by biology. So it's one of the indicators about that. And now Curiosity has been roaming around this place for, yeah, I don't know, a couple of years, um, five years maybe, um, roaming around Mars in this particular crater looking for signs that may be scientifically interesting. And very recently, um, like within a week or so, they discovered a high increase in the amount of methane. And that's interesting, but it also went away almost instantly, right? So it was, we can now localize that as to where it seemed to have come from, what went on. Now, it's always possible in these things we made a scientific mistake, that there was some parameter we didn't calculate for. But over time, you get better and better at understanding what those are and eliminating those. But in this case, the ability to roam around the surface and look for extant biological signs that are relevant to life in the universe was really part of the crux of what we're doing. And myself, as part of the commercial world, uh, we're trying to make that affordable and cheaper and to do. Um, this is just a picture of our robot that we're going to be sending to uh, um, the moon next September. And that's all I've got. Um, we have a few minutes to uh, argue with each other. 
<laughs> and uh, one of the questions that comes to my mind immediately is uh, the relative roles in the near future on the moon of, of robotic and human and coupled robotic human. You know, where's the low fly, low hanging fruit? Uh, but you guys can argue about anything you want. Go for it. <laughs> um, I, I wrote an article once about 15 years or so ago in an astrobiology magazine. Um, it's not robots versus humans, it's both. That was the title of the article, and, and that's my personal firm belief. I mean, we, uh, I know we talked a little bit about this um, ahead of time, but the uh, principal investigator for the MER rovers, the spirit and opportunity that Michael just mentioned, um, said that they would do in their initial 90-day mission what a good field geologist might do in, in a half an hour or an hour, something like that. So um, that, uh, that doesn't say that you should uh, do everything by humans, um, because humans are tremendously expensive to, uh, to send to places. I mean, you know, we haven't done this for um, nearly 50 years with the moon. I hope we're going to move forward with it like we talked about, um, but that's why. And, uh, and yet we have done a series of wonderful robotic investigations. So you can do a lot of robotic um, missions um, for every human mission. That being said, I'm a firm believer in the importance of human missions to motivate people and as well as get science done. Yeah, so I think, um, I think it's useful to sort of open the box a little bit and look at what's going on here. So if you actually look at the fundamental physics of what it required, you know, amount, this much oxygen, this much propellant, this much metal, it's incredibly cheap to send humans to places like outer space, the moon, Mars. It's just cheap. The physics, the fundamental components are relatively cheap. So the difference between having a relatively cheap cost to getting humans to the moon or Mars is really in the process. It's in the process of what we do on, on that. It's a, there's part of it that's associated with learning, and that's incredibly important. But if you take away the learning, just assume we just repeat what Apollo did. So in principle, we don't have to learn anything to repeat what Apollo did. So if you take that away, the process should be cheap. So I think the argument about science versus humans largely stems about how am I focusing my money. And what the commercial world is trying to do right now is to make that equation closer to the cost associated with fundamental principles of what you do, rather than um, the way we've traditionally approached and gotten to where we're going. So can we make it cheap? Very cheap. Um, Elon Musk, um, uh, a person I respect a great deal, people sometimes have mixed feelings about because he tweets like our president. Um, <laughs> but Elon Musk has, has taken a goal for SpaceX, uh, which is a phenomenal goal. It is he wants to take a human being alive <laughs> and remain alive uh, to Mars for the price, price of a typical California house. So a few hundred thousand dollars, right? <laughs> now, if you, if you ask NASA, if you ask NASA the price for sending a human to Mars, it is X number of billion, you know, 50 billion, 100 billion per person. Especially if you want to bring them back. Yeah, yeah, if you want to bring them back. <laughs> That's right. Either way, either way it's going to cost you that much, <laughs> pretty much, just to buy by two. <laughs> There are certainly people who would be happy to go, they say, and not come back. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's I, right. I, I'm in that category. I, but I, I, it's not the intention. That's not a suicide. That's an intention to, um, as, as the people did hundreds of years ago, to come from Europe to the Americas. You don't necessarily plan to come back. Um, well, so, that, I mean, that's, and that's a good Point. I mean, going from Europe to uh, the Americas, right? I mean, Ferdinand and Isabella sent Columbus. Um, it, they would not have continued to send um, missions, um, fleets of, of boats like that, if it was just from their treasury for hundreds of years. You know, it, it, it was the commercial value that, uh, that made Spain and then other countries 
come back. And, and that's, I think, really the game changer. Now, the question is, what is, you know, what is that um, killer app you know, for, um, for the moon or for Mars going to be? Is it, is it tourism? Is it um, space mining or other resource utilization? I don't, I don't, think, uh, I don't think we know yet. Um, but uh, but if, it's, if it's out there, that is going to do exactly what you're saying and drive that cost way down. Yes, and another perspective is, is another model is to take Antarctica. So we have been spending money and sending the people to Antarctica for decades, since International Geophysical Year, which is sometime in the 60s or something, right? So since that point, we've had constant, although people don't stay constantly, we've basically had a constant cache of people that have been in Antarctica, and we've done scientific investigations. I think the difference in perception has to do with perception of cost. Yeah. Um, there's, there's one other point I didn't quite make before. So from David's question, uh, is it humans versus robots? So I'm arguing that humans, if, if, you, if you get humans much cheaper, it's, it's easier to do that. But what I would argue is that when humans go to the moon or Mars or wherever, when humans go, they have the, they're going to take the capability of carrying a lot of mass. So what, what is now in a scientific instrument, you have the little rover that I showed you of ours, or you have the Curiosity rover. These are tiny little things. They don't do very much. They can't carry many instruments. What I want to really carry is I want to go to, you know, get Kim's lab and take that, right? I want to, I want to have all the instruments that I have here on Earth and have it with a good scientist sitting there using them. That kind of scientific capability on a planetary surface requires you Certainly, if you don't pay gazillion dollars miniaturizing, it takes a lot of mass. Um, but they can be relatively cheap if the flight was cheap, just to take off-the-shelf scientific instruments. So. Right. I, I like your Antarctica analogy, and it reminds me of a talk that I went to by Chris McKay, our, our friend uh, from NASA Ames, one of the world's um, premier Mars and scientists and astrobiologists. And he was talking about uh, lunar exploration. Um, this was maybe about 10 years ago, and, and uh, he's been to Antarctica many, many times and made some interesting uh, discoveries there. And, um, and he made the analogy that uh, lunar exploration is, would change fundamentally just as Antarctic um, science and exploration did once we established bases there. As he put it, we didn't even know the questions to ask when, uh, when, we, when Shackleton and, and so many of the other um, exploration voyages first went there, analogous to uh, the Apollos of, of, uh, of 50 years ago. It was only when we established a permanent presence and, uh, and were able to observe in a near real-time basis that, uh, that we knew the questions to ask. What will your fairies rover do? Ah, so um, first off, um, this mission that we are proposing to do next year, and it's not without political machinations that are going on between now and then, so we'll see how it actually ends up. But our, but our proposed mission is intended to be a proof of principle that for a very cheap price, you can land on the surface, you can land scientific instruments. And our part of that experiment is to show that you can do mobility for a very cheap price. Um, so what I keep telling my team is, is a very low bar for what we really have to accomplish. Get off, get out in the sun, communicate, take pictures of the lander, show how the soil is disturbed. But actually, um, there's an alternative design that we've, built, that we've looked at, we haven't yet built. Um, which allows us to carry a pretty powerful spectral instrument to look at the spectral characteristics of the soil that we disturb. So are there volatiles being ex exposed as we do it? Uh, one of the things we're going to do on this particular flight is we're gonna, there are two uh, neutron spectrometers, which one might think is redundant or something, but I think it's great. So they're, uh, sorry, not neutron spectrometers, mass spectrometers. So there are two mass spectrometers on this, uh, and they're basically going to look for material that sort of gets bounced up into, the, into the, the space around those mass spectrometers. So these two mass spectrometers, we are going to drive our, we're going to, after they've calibrated themselves and settled down a bit, 
we're going to drive in front of them and do disturbance so that we're going to also get mass spectral mm -hmm. measurements. So, mm -hmm. so we're going to aid in spectral measurements of the characteristic of the soil. Interesting. So you uh, might see if there's any volatiles attached to the regolith or, or whatever. Absolutely. And That's we also, great. And we also uh, have ex other experiments which are associated with looking at, you know, when a, a rocket comes down, you disturb a lot of stuff. You blow it around everywhere, right? And there's a disturbance of the ground around you because the thrust is coming down. And unlike the Earth, where you have an atmosphere, on the moon, when you come down, there's no atmosphere. So if you ever look at the Apollo images of landing, they're great because it's like the thruster, the rockets go off and instantly there is nothing. It's not like dust hanging around the air because on the, on the moon, some fun physics about this, having no, no atmosphere, particles just follow parabolics and they just instantly go away. They just fly out and they're gone. Um, one of the characteristics of that, so what you're doing is you're blowing all this stuff away from the area around the lander, and you're also depositing chemicals from that lander on the soil. So it gives us a way to figure out part of what's going on there, so we're going to do observations of that. And uh, finally, we hope to do some uh, experimental observation of the terminator, which is the edge between day and night. Uh, and there's some indications that there's elevation of particles. Um, at the terminator, as, as this terminator goes across, electrostatic forces cause things to go up. Um, we are going to do uh, some observations um, to add to the understanding of that. We are going to open the question uh, opportunities and discussion to all of you, uh, and I suggest those who are interested queue up at this microphone. And while you're queuing, uh, I have a question for you, Greg. Uh -huh. um, one of the uh, long-term goals that appeared in one of your graphs uh, suggested humans might be headed for the polar regions of the moon. Yes. yes. What unique value is there in humans going to the polar regions? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the idea behind the next human mission in, in uh, 2024, if we get our budget, um, is to go to the South Pole. Um, of, of the uh, moon. We, my institute is involved in, in helping choose a destination. The idea there, I had talked about um, the permanently shadowed regions and, uh, and the volatiles, the water in particular, that are uh, trapped there. And so uh, the idea is that this could be a resource-rich area um, to send humans, and in combination with uh, landers and rovers, such as the ones that uh, Michael's company is, is doing, we want to learn about the extent of those volatiles, we want to learn how to use them, and then we want to, to build ways of, uh, of using them that will then future, um, will, will then fuel future uh, lunar exploration and perhaps um, exploration of Mars. One of the key things um, here, the moon has um, about one-sixth the gravity of, of the uh, Earth, but it actually has, um, to get something to uh, escape velocity from the moon requires about one-fiftieth of, uh, of the energy. And so if you are using a spacecraft that's fueled by hydrogen and oxygen, the two components of water, and you can loft that to escape velocity from the from the uh, moon, manufacture it on the moon and loft it, you have a much, much cheaper source of uh, fuel for doing missions to uh, Mars or elsewhere in the solar system. Let me yep. just add a little bit to, to Greg's comment. Um, and, and I want to be sensitive to what everyone knows. So we, we talk about these permanently shadowed areas. The moon the moon spins uh, roughly perpendicular to, to its direction to the sun. As a consequence of that, uh, it doesn't have strong seasons like we do on Earth. If you think about our Earth, it's, it's the fact that the spin axis is not oriented perpendicular to its, the direction of the sun, that in part of the year, the southern hemisphere, the other part of the year, the northern hemisphere is sort of more focused on those. On the moon, it, it, there, it's pretty perpendicular. As a consequence of that, there are these craters in the south pole of the moon, the north pole of the moon, and on Venus, I'm mean, sorry, Mercury and places like that, where the sunlight just never gets into them. 
this, they're just so deep relative to the spin of the sun, the sun never quite makes it all the way in. So they're dark all the time. It turns out that there's a few areas near those where there's a lot of sunlight. So the sunlight, instead of it being 14 days of night, 14 days of, days of uh, sunlight, there's maybe 20 days or 22 days of sunlight sometimes. Yeah, that's right. That's an important point. Let's, let's uh, get the questions. We have uh, enough people there. If we can take two minutes per question, we'll get through in the time available before they throw us out at uh, 8.15. Please. I'm very concerned. Is, is this on? Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I'm very concerned about the effects of radiation on naked, or human bodies on the moon and on Mars and transit between them. How much research has gone on? And uh, will we be forced eventually to just use robots because bodies simply can't take the radiation? Sure. Um, I guess I could take a first stab at that. It's a, it's a really good question. And, um, and, the ans and we don't have... Um, answers yet. Um, we have done a lot of research on this. I actually started in NASA's um, life sciences program and uh, there were a lot of radiation experiments looking at uh, various frequencies of, of radiation. But um, it's also known that, uh, that a trip for Mars is very dangerous in terms of cancer risk and other things. So will the solution be radiation shielding? Will, um, I know NASA has done some studies on, um, on molecular level repair of, uh, of radiation damage. Um, that looks promising as well. Uh, but bottom line, we don't have any answers and that's a, it's a really good question and a, and a topic that we need to do a lot of work on. And I'll add a little bit to that. If you, um, so, there's several types of radiation. Uh, some of those, a you know, piece of aluminum foil in front of you will stop, right? Um, some radiation comes from the sun uh, and some radiation comes galactic. So the galaxy generates very high energy particles, often of high mass. Um, we have pretty good experience on understanding what's going on with the guys coming out of the sun. Sometimes they're really dangerous if you have a solar event but for the most part, we sort of know what it is and you can sort of manage it. So assuming we can manage those solar events, we're probably okay. We have less data about the galactic part. Um, and so that becomes an, a question mark in the equation, but. Right. Next, yeah. please. What measures have been put into place or will be put into place to make sure that everybody plays nice on the moon? What I, if I somebody steps back and says, okay, I'm going to get all ready to go. As soon as you guys discover there's platinum, they're going to go take it or cause some irreversible environmental damage. Yes. So, um, Margaret Rice um, at SETI Institute, and I've been in a lot of discussions about how do you preserve the moon in a way that makes sense, both from a commercial perspective partner point of view, but also from the point of view of, um, you know, scientifically and in terms of you, the world. So, you know, what we would like, do we build national parks, our equivalent of national parks, so we preserve part of what's going on. Um, and when there become resources that are valuable, I mean, you only have to go to Wyoming to see what you can really, what humans can really do to the earth when we decide there's something valuable there. Um, I, I don't know where that's going to go. I think we have to find, uh, be sensitive to what other people are caring about and looking at. And I think as a community, the scientific community, the commercial ex community, and, um, and the governments sort of need to find ways that actually are sensible. And I think there are some sensible paths there. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. and. and one, um, one example that we're dealing with um, at my institute, I had mentioned the uh, astrophysics um, research in, in my talk, and um, that radio quiet far side, if you have a lot of spacecraft that are going, going around, particularly on the far side, it's not going to be quiet anymore. And uh, you need a long time to accumulate enough data to be able to see to those early epochs of the uh, of the universe, and so um, 
we don't have the answers yet. Um, I'm, what I'm encouraged by is at least the scientific community is playing nice um, you know, with each other. They realize these are important questions to be asked. So um, my fingers are crossed that we'll come up with a good solution. That's a super good question. Kim? Um, Greg, you mentioned we need to engage the whole world to go forward to the moon. How can we do that? I, I love that question. <laughs> That's, I'm, so, well, I'm looking for answers. Some yeah. questions. <laughs> now yeah. all of us are become ambassadors of a very ambitious project and yeah. that has you know, transformational natures that we can't even imagine. But yes, how do we engage the whole world? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, first of all, uh, I'm going to mention your new position, and I think it's wonderful. Um, the, the NASA Ames Research Center um, Public Affairs Office has seen fit to bring a scientist on board. One might think that that would have been done 50 years ago, but, you know, guess what? They're doing it right now, and, and Kim, one of our, Dr. Enigo Smith, one of our premier scientists at NASA Ames is in a position of, of uh, being an advocate for, uh, for this new lunar work, and I think this is great. So that's, that's one of the things, but advocacy all around. So um, when, you know, I'll, I'll just say something that's close to my heart. Um, when David asked me to be his deputy with the Lunar Science Institute, one of the first things that I did is start an international program, international partners program. The very first scientists that we had at the NASA Lunar Science Institute were Canadians through our Canadian partnership. And, um, and so we have done a lot. We've actually, with our European partners, created um, a, an annual European Lunar Symposium, a pan-European pan um, lunar science consortium that, um, that when I talk with these partners, they say that it's made a real difference in getting them together, get, getting these communities together. Events such as this are, are super important um, and, and getting the word out that this is a really exciting endeavor that humanity is, uh, is engaging in. Um, I, I also think, um, gosh, I could talk about this subject for an hour, but, uh, but I, also, I also think that engaging non-traditional folks is, is really important. Um, one of the things, I'm fairly new at, at, at my job, but one of the things that uh, is really important to me is, is engaging um, you know, underrepresented folks um, both in, in the United States um, as, well as, uh, as well as the rest of the world that might not see a place for themselves otherwise in this endeavor, but we need them. So um, I, I could go on, but, but don't. <laughs> but don't. <laughs> I'll say a word. Um, I think what we do is incredibly exciting. Um, and it's normally viewed as almost propaganda at communicating that you should be excited about what we're doing. Um, and my personal experience has been that the way to engage people is to actually tell them what you're doing in a way that makes sense, right? That we, we don't discover hypotheses in a pristine environment. You know, we're confused most of the time. You look at things in the world, and, and there's an awful lot that goes on in science, which is incredibly intriguing, but we try to clean it up and tell them some packaged version of it. I think if we take science and really communicate in a way that people can understand the issues, and no matter how old you are, and that you can see what's going on, I think the engagement comes naturally. Next question, please. So I think that the preliminary design conversations for the system that was to become SLS took place in 1988. And if SLS is a prerequisite for Gateway, and if Gateway is a prerequisite for sending people to space, or sending people to the moon, excuse me, um, are we just in fantasy camp here? I mean, is it not making more sense that the private sector will just completely lap this whole thing? Because it's probably going to get pushed off into the 2030s. There'll be a presidential change, it'll just change. And if we're going to be working hard on this, should we not be working on things that are more concrete that do not rely on these dependencies? Yeah. So I'll give you a cynical answer. 
the cynical answer is um, commercial endeavors are of two kinds. One kind lives off government contracts. They're already eating it up, right? So whatever you do, as long as the government decides to do it, you have commercial entities that make their living uh, selling to the government. And, and partially, I would argue that that's part of why things are expensive. The other, thing, other side of that are people that are very lean and often have to make judgments really carefully about where they spend their efforts and they want to be not following every dollar but having made very strategic investments. And I don't think you'll find, I, I'm not speaking specifically to this you know, gateway or not, but I, I think you'll find people in both camps and hopefully it'll balance out in a way that we have it covered. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I mean, I can't argue that the SLS, and for those who aren't aware, that's the space launch system. This is the, this is the um, Saturn V-sized rocket that uh, NASA has been building now for quite a number of years. I can't, I can't, I have to agree with you, there have been a lot of issues. Um, I'm a bit of a student of space history and, and, um, and the budget profile for, um, for, the, for the Saturn V was entirely different. You know, it was an entirely different program. It had the nation behind it um, right from the beginning. They had all the money they needed and, and more. And, um, you know, I know from my own experiences managing much smaller projects and from friends who have managed bigger ones that uh, when you're strung out, as SLS has been, um, you have problems. You know, you make mistakes, you can't hire the best people, um, it's difficult. Now, I, I was privileged to go to a meeting um, in, in, uh, at Stennis and, and see some of the components of this, and there is a lot of progress that's being made. I'm, I'm sure that we'll have problems with it. I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, there will be hiccups, maybe even, who knows. But, uh, but I think that it, once it's developed, it'll be a, uh, a, a good system. I think one thing about so, our memory uh, that's- Hey, open. Mike. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, so we're running out of time, <laughs> unfortunately. And uh, so what I suggest, because I'd like to let every, the, the remaining folks who are standing there and have been waiting to give them an opportunity to ask a question, we're gonna do a sprint. So you're going to ask a question, make it as concise as possible, and each of these folks will have 15 seconds <laughs> to give you an answer. And that'll sharpen up the thought processes a bit. So, it's online. <laughs> all right, go right ahead. So uh, this is my question to Mike here uh, about your upcoming rover. Um, just from what I understand, the, the lunar surface is not that... Uh, hospitable in terms of compared to say uh, our own or Mars, uh, it's uh, very abrasive. What sort of longevity do you see for your rovers specifically regarding say uh, the Mars ones with their resounding decade long missions? There we go, sorry. 15 seconds, Mike. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, on the moon, we are not designing that rover to survive the lunar night. So at most two weeks, so it's not a pressing issue in the first rover. Okay. Awesome. Great. great, good question, good answer. Greg Next. and Michael. <laughs> Both you um, mentioned something about the moon's craters being the coldest places in the solar system. What about the moon? The moon is circling the third planet from the sun. What about the moon circling the fourth planet? What about craters on the fifth and sixth planets? Wouldn't they be colder? Good question. Um, the, the, um, the issue is um, having those permanently shadowed craters. And so, and, and when I say permanent, some of these places have not seen sunlight for a billion years. And so all they're seeing is, is uh, deep space. And that's why they're uh, so cold. You know, they're, they're, uh, there are some places that are colder than the surface of Pluto, believe it or not. But from our purpose, the important thing is they're cold enough. They're cold enough. <laughs> they don't have to be the coldest place in the universe as long as there's ice there. That's right. One resource we won't need to worry about is refrigeration. <laughs> so, go ahead. Okay. So what... Um, type of experiments would you like to try on the moon besides chemistry and geology? What a brilliant question. 15 seconds each of you. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take the first one? Great question. Uh, yes, I mean, sort of as a technologist, we would like to be able to demonstrate that we can survive a long period of time on the moon and also that we can survive overnight. 
Great. Great. And so uh, the one that, uh, that really gets me the most is the uh, astronomy and astrophysics one about uh, finding out about how the universe's first stars started through, uh, through radio telescopes. And can I ask um, how old you are and what grade you're in? I'm 12 and I'm going into seventh grade. I, that's awesome that you're here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Her resume is going to be on your desk in a couple of years, Greg. So. <laughs> yep. let, let me just make one concluding comment, which I hope that we really are on the, uh, the, at the birth of a whole new system of solar system exploration. Uh, places like SpaceX have shown that you can dramatically reduce the cost of access to space. Uh, and if we can get access to the almost free fuel from the ice at the lunar poles, that again could be an order of magnitude improvement. You know, we may be in the position, maybe it's that next generation, of really having the ability to become a, a solar system uh, exploration-oriented people and, uh, and not just a few elite scientists or, or astronauts going into space. That's right. We're, we're taking our, our first real and permanent steps beyond our cradle. That's the, that's the way that I think about this. Big steps for humankind. That's right. <laughs> All right, so I'd um, like to leave you with this final thought uh, because, you know, Greg mentioned before, hopefully it's not just about footprints and flags, but it's about science and exploration and curiosity. And when we do the kind of work that all of us are involved in, what we're ultimately involved in is turning a mirror back on ourselves, right? We learn a lot about ourselves, about life on this planet, when we in, uh, embark on the kind of studies and research we do. I'd like you to, when you go home or before, but not while you're driving, <laughs> Google that famous photograph that was called moon uh, Earthrise over, to, over the moon, taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts. So before we actually landed on the moon, it's that famous picture of a, of a half Earth rising above the moon. And I can't remember, unfortunately, which astronaut said this about that photograph, but he, he said, we went uh, to the moon and we discovered the Earth. And uh, it, was, it has become one of the most impactful sort of uh, science and environmental <laughs> uh, consciousness stimulating images ever in the, in the history of humankind. So, so this is why we do the stuff we do. Uh, we really enjoyed sharing it all with you. I'd like to thank Greg and Mike and David for this evening. Thank you.